Really appreciate that, Don. It was true. Don exposed to myself when I was just beginning this job the ability he had to make some changes in our admissions and scholarship programs and <clears throat> I eventually gave him a lot of responsibility which he wore well. I want to begin by thanking the Alumni Association and the Office of Technology Commercialization for having this event. I think it's part of what I'll be saying a little bit later about how we have to talk about what we're doing. And um, I also want to thank Tanya and Don and Ian who first let me know about this award that will be given sometime soon and uh, really think that was a very thoughtful thing and I appreciate that too. Dr. Capilouto has joined us. I know how busy he is <laughs> and I know uh, this time of year especially I will say that he's done some very heartwarming things in the last few weeks that I've learned about and I appreciate your support of entrepreneurship, the expansion of the Office of Commercialization and keeping that fire burning because it's important to this state because uh, I thought the other day, uh, Kentucky can is a very important saying. I thought maybe before, I'm a long time Kentuckian, we could have said Kentucky could, but didn't. Because we should have had the international harvester here for, for tobacco harvesting. We should have had the Cyrus company here for doing coal mining if we had stressed entrepreneurship a long time ago and had our people who knew how to do those things have the financial wherewithal to invent new ideas and new ways to do those. But Kentucky Can is an important organization that's seeing some remarkable things happen, and I appreciate that effort and I know how hard that is. But thank you so much for being here. When you get to this time in life, you, you look back and you think about how did you get to where you are. Uh, I wouldn't be here without my family. I'm glad that Don mentioned them. The, uh, if you're in a startup company or you've been through that process, you know what it's like. It's not easy and to have the support of your family and the continuing support through two startups and 10 years as president of this institution, uh, they've given a lot. So I thank you all very much for what you all have done with me and for me. I also have to think about the employees that took a risk. Many of them were students who had never had a job before. Their first jobs were to go to work for Projectron or Databeam, companies that their parents had never heard of or their grandparents had never heard of. And that's a risk, and that's something I do encourage students to do when they graduate from here is instead of going out and getting a job, think about going out and creating a job and taking a risk with some of these startups because it's very, very exciting. The Projectron Data Beam and KSTC are things that I'm extremely proud of, and um, you know, thank all those folks. I want to just go through a couple of things. I'll tell you a few war stories. Every entrepreneur will do that, uh, as you know. And then look at how do we get to where we are at this point, and then wrap up by just having one suggestion about what we need to do going forward. I graduated in the UK, as Don said, and received a full ride to MIT, very fortunately. While there, I did get six patents, but as importantly, I got smitten by the high-tech startup bug that was around the Boston area. Amar Bose was on my master's committee. <clears throat> he had just started Bose Acoustics. I met a young man who was a Harvard student at one time. As a freshman, he raised money to, to try to build a ceramic engine. Didn't make it, lost the money, but he took me down to meet the investors who put that money in. And I thought, that's not gonna be good. You know, they lost a million bucks, why do we wanna go see them? And they were so impressed with what he was thinking about. He later started MIPS Corporation, which is a public traded company, and then started another corporation even more recently. That's the kind of sense you had when you were in that area. You just felt it. I used to, when I was in business, I'd go to Silicon Valley quite a bit. And I'm not a breakfast eater. But when I was out there, I'd always go to breakfast and I'd sit in the middle because you could hear four different deals being cut around the rooms. And when I came back to Kentucky, I would take a customer out to the Green Mall to one of the restaurants down there. And um, one day I heard somebody talking about technology behind me. I looked around and it was Hub Spencer who was one of my employees. So uh, we haven't spread that much, but we've got more to talk about now. And I will get to that in just a few moments. Following graduation, Pat and I wanted to return to our home state. We're native Kentuckians and try to bring some of that Boston experience back to Kentucky because we felt that there was a need. Uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, the entrepreneurial environment was basically non-existent at that time. There was no venture capital. I was using a book I found in the MIT bookstore by Dave Dibble about how to start a company. And you go to the back where it lists all the venture capital institutions by state, and you just skip Kentucky. No entry whatsoever. There were no angel investors. 
they were looking at high tech. My teleconferencing and flight simulation concepts didn't involve coal, whiskey, tobacco, or horses. And so you just couldn't get much attention. I put probably talked to 30 wealthy individuals in Kentucky about investing. Basically put them to sleep. One in particular about fell off of a stool in my laboratory over here in the building, in the Anderson building. There were no SBR grants in Kentucky, zero. And they were the <coughs> going uh, real gangbusters in Michigan and other states, but not here. There was no resource of individuals who had had high-tech experiences before they could give you some mentoring and tell you what to do or what not to do. Well, after seven years of trying to raise money, I got an audience with Jim Stuckert and a group that Jim led at Hilliard Lines. You'll see his name on the building here on campus, a double UK graduate. They helped me raise $1.8 million. When they put their name on it, when Hilliard Lines put their name on it, that came in in six days. And so, as Ian mentioned a minute ago, money's here. It's just a question of finding a way to get it into the hands of those of you who have bright ideas. UK was not very entrepreneurial <coughs> at that time. I had two experiences. Uh, I went up for tenure my fourth year when I was here. The area committee denied the tenure and said that I needed to wait till some of my publications got published. But somebody told me that I could appeal that to the president of the university if I felt that I should get it. I met with the vice president of academic affairs who would be the provost today, a fellow named Lewis Cochran. Uh, he was a former physics professor. When I met with him, <clears throat> he told me that the denial was because I just didn't have enough publications that were already in print. I told him I had X number of publications, refereed, and I had six patents, and I thought that should be sufficient. He looked at me and he said, you know, the problem is they didn't count the patents as publications. He said, do you know why? No. They don't have any. And he said, I think that university professors in engineering especially should have patents. So he recommended to President Singletary that I get tenure, which I did. The area committee didn't like that a lot, but <clears throat> that was the beginning of my career of trying to do some different things. There's a second experience I had. We had a new internal candidate who became dean of the College of Engineering. I was always talking to my students about someday I'm going to start a company. You know, I've got some patents and I want to create jobs. I was watching 80% of the electrical engineering students leave Kentucky to find jobs. And I knew we could compete. When this fellow got into his office, the first week he called me down to his dean's office and said, how do you think he can be a professor here and have a company on the outside? I said, well, if I was still at MIT and I didn't have a company, they'd be calling me to the office saying, why aren't you doing something? you know, out in the world, real world. I left the UK a year later and started Projectron. So those are just some of the environment that was there and some of the issues that you faced. But let's look at the situation today and kind of how it happened. 32 years ago, as Ian mentioned, Chris Kimmel and I started the Kentucky Science and Technology Corporation, KSTC. The three missions, as he mentioned, were to improve K-12 education and math science, help Kentucky's universities become more research competitive, and enhance Kentucky's economy to make it more technology driven. It was a pretty lonely experience. We try to talk to people about investing in KSDC, and they say, well, this year we're focusing on the charity fund of such name. Uh, next year, maybe we'll give you all some money. And that's not the same thing. You know, this is an investment in the future of Kentucky. I'm reminded of a story that I heard a general give when I was in business. He said, being a general is like being the star at the top of a Christmas tree, and the hard part is get the lights lit all the way to the bottom. Well, Chris and I were at the top of that tree, and there weren't many lights. It was clear that in order to really do that, and to create something that's sustainable, something that lasts, that you have to have a lot of people involved that have to be out there doing work in similar fashion. And many lights have come on since that period of time. At the universities, the administrative attitudes, as I mentioned about President Capilouto, have changed. Universities are realizing now that that is part of the mission. Used to, we like to educate and entertain people, and now we need to help them find jobs and create jobs so that the economy improves. The founding of organizations such as the Office of Technology Commercialization and the Von Allman Center for Entrepreneurship are other things that you're beginning to see now. 
And when you look at the annual report from the Office of Technology Commercialization, you'll see that $5 million were distributed to inventors since 2010, $15 million distributed to colleges and departments, 101 inventions disclosed, 62 patent applications, 23 patents issued, and 29 licenses obtained. That's an activity that will be able to make a difference in a lot of people's lives. Warren Nash announced at the 2018 Lexington Venture Club's Global Entrepreneurship Week celebration that the Central Kentucky entrepreneurial community in the previous year had created 280 new jobs, raised $50.6 million. These companies had 952 employees with average salaries of $77,000. And those are the people that we need to keep. I used to say when I give speeches before I had this job, I told the search committee, I said, I'm not just finally getting interested in, in the university. I gave 88 speeches before I took the UK job on improving the economy and changing education. And I would say that when we lose these kids, we lose their children and their children's children. And that's one reason we put in that legacy program where alumni who live out of state can bring their children back here on, on the reduced in-state tuition, or reduced in tuition. In addition to the accomplishments that are happening on campus, the Coal Stream Research Campus now has over 50 organizations with 2,100 employees. And so things have really happened within the, this university in particular. State government had some lights come on. People may not know about it, but they ought to read the Innovation Act of 2000. Chris Kimball basically wrote that. Jody Richards sponsored it in the House. It created several things. One was the founding of the Kentucky Science and Engineering Foundation and allowed KSTC to make the investment decisions into Kentucky startup companies. We had to use outside advisors and so forth, but that was really the first time that state money had been put into an organization to make investments without the political uh, hand on the dollars. It also helped to start the very successful SBIR, STTR matching program. There are many people who were getting phase one matches, or phase one SBIRs at that time, but you could die between a phase one and a phase two. So we first started getting the state to put up bridge money to keep them alive during that period. And then later Mahindra Jain got them into this really successful match program. The Bevan administration has taken a strong interest in building an entrepreneurial economy. They've created an office of entrepreneurship. They moved some of the things which were previously programs outside of the cabinet into the cabinet for economic development. They have the Kentucky Innovation Network with 12 sites now which can try to help entrepreneurship grow throughout the state. And they've begun providing funding for accelerators and incubators, one of which is also Inc. that I'm very proud of those three guys. In addition, the city has had some lights come on. You know, the, the mayor, President Mayor Linda Gorton, has stressed entrepreneurship and startups as part of her economic development platform. I'm really proud of the Bluegrass Business Development Partnership which was an idea by the former Gatton business dean, Dick First. He came in the office one day and said, we need to make it easier on people. They don't need to go here, here, and here. We need to have one-stop shop. And uh, Jenna Greathouse and Bob have really gotten behind that idea, and that's been a very big help to a lot of people trying to locate here or start a company. The major thing, though, is that some community lights finally came on. You have to have citizens involved in this. Uh, presidents come and go, governors come and go, citizens are going to always be there. And you don't have continuity beyond 10 years if you don't have the citizens involved. The Bluegrass Angels were founded in 2004. David Goodnight and Chris Young have really taken major, le major leadership roles in that. David spoke at recently at the Spar Angel Investor Summit and provided some information. The Bluegrass Angels have invested in 47 companies in Kentucky, they have 80 members who are investors in that fund. They're presently raising a $6 million fund, which is their fourth fund. They've closed out their first three. I was really pleased that some of you may remember Dean Harvey, who worked here some time ago. Very quiet, mild-mannered fellow. But somehow he started the Le Lexington Venture Club to just invite people from the citizens to come in who had money and could hear some of the things going on so that they might invest. And that was kind of the beginning of that whole bluegrass effort. So some of us who are aging our way off of the Christmas tree uh, are really, really happy that a lot of the lights have come on 
in our staying on and, and burning brightly. However, I'm going to close with a comment that we need to do more. We have gotten where we are, and we're probably going to be the best sellers of entrepreneurship there is in the state of Kentucky. But we've got to do more. We've got to talk about it. When we were attempting to sell the concept of UK becoming a top 20 public research university, we toured the state with a bus, with a lot of students and legislators, went to 22 cities around the state. I would tell the audiences, I know you've got a basketball IQ. <laughs> you know who missed a shot back in 1960 and you're still mad about it because it cost us a victory or a championship. But you don't have a research IQ. You don't know why we need to have a top research university in the state of Kentucky. But whose job is it to tell them? It's UK's job. Because we are the land grant, we are the flagship, and we are the ones who are going to do it. But we need their support, and we need them talking to their legislators. I feel the same way about entrepreneurship. You are all the best people many times though we preach to our own choir. And we are the only ones that can expand that choir. People don't move unless there's something to move them. I think Newton said that some years ago. We can expand it, but you've got to get out and talk about the successes that you've had and amplify that talk. Bill Samuels, a former CEO of Maker's Mark, a very bright fella, I called him one day and I said, Bill, I've been selling $50,000 systems to the federal government and military. I gotta start selling a $100 product now. I don't know how to do that, but it's kind of close to one of your bottles. What do you suggest? He said, Doc, marketing to the masses is extremely expensive. You gotta get a conversation going. Let the people sell your product. And so you need to get articles published. There's a great aerospace article recently that not only mentioned the number of dollars that are being shipped out of this state in the way of exports for, for um, aerospace, but it also mentioned Space Tango and some of the work over at Moorhead in Space. It actually began to mix the typical economic development lingo that comes from the state and the jobs created with the fact that we are doing some innovation. That's a step forward. We need more and more and more of those articles. We need better TV coverage. We need to talk to our family members. We need to talk to our neighbors, talk to our legislators, talk to potential investors. When we start getting people making money with this investment, that's when they'll be able to go out and brag about it. People don't brag about losing money, they brag about making money. But they also, and I will guarantee that Jim Stuckard convinced Hilliards to invest in DataBeam because I said, Mr. Stuckard, I'm gonna create jobs for UK engineering graduates. He said, we'll help you. There's an altruistic need that you can use to raise funds in this state if you can make contact with the right people. We must be the ones to provide the leadership. One of my my only definition of leadership is taking people where they need to go, whether they know it or not. This state needed to go for better education years ago. This state needs now to go to more inventive, entrepreneurial, economic development. Kentuckians have to have an entrepreneurial economy or we become the assemblers of every people's ideas. And that's not okay with me. You are already leaders in what you're presently doing. Now you must become leaders in what other people need to do. And you can do it by vocalizing, you can do it by continuing your success and talk it up a lot. Congratulations to everybody that we're gonna hear from later today. I really appreciate the forum, I appreciate the recognition of fun at this time of life to see that you're still remembered. <laughs> and, uh, and I really uh, thank you so much for this, thank you. When I was named president of the University of Kentucky, Dr. Todd included me in the SEC president's meeting. They meet in June. I didn't start my job until July, but I graciously sat in the corner and listened. And it was helpful to get a leg up and sort of understand what you were getting into. I had a lot to learn. I certainly heard at that meeting, and then I heard at subsequent meetings, uh, something that he and another uh, president championed. We went there just to talk about athletics, uh, academics. Uh, had to be a focus uh, and we started something first known as SECU uh, that was really his inspiration and uh, you know in in these positions seniority comes uh, quickly um, 
as of June, I've been, I've been in the job eight years, and out of 14 presidents, I'll be third in seniority. So people tend to forget what everybody discussed before you. I was so proud to share with Dr. Todd when the SEC, uh, a few months ago, was able uh, to proudly state uh, that every university in the Southeastern Conference had achieved the highest level of research recognition by the Carnegie Foundation. And, and that I attribute to his emphasis and words around those tables. And then certainly this entrepreneurship and, and believing in ourselves that Kentucky can do these things, his story was not just talk, uh, he walked the walk. And, and you heard that story and it's inspired so many. I mean, when I got here and realized, gee, in a short amount of time, uh, not too many places could do this, we, we doubled the number of engineering graduates. And I think, yeah, there are a lot of things he did. He worked with Tom Lester. He was really the inspiration, but his story, so many kids wanted to dream as he did and achieve what he did and return to Kentucky and make a contribution. And then I'm glad he mentioned the legacy program because uh, at times I do out of state uh, student recruitment events for high school students. So I'll tell you about one of them, but they're all similar in, in this vein. So we, we played our bowl game this year and uh, enrollment management office uh, tasked me to go to, while I was in Orlando, I went to, uh, I think it was Lake Mary, Florida. I hope I got the city right. I'd never really heard of Lake Mary, Florida, but I drove about 40 miles, and there were um, 50 students and their families interested in the University of Kentucky. So I, I walked around and introduced myself to every family. So uh, I'd say half of those families, Dr. Todd, were Kentuckians that regretted having to leave to get a great job. Yeah. And, but all of them wanted their children to come home and all of them knew about that legacy program. <laughs> so you had the foresight and, and you know, and, and this next generation, maybe we're gonna bring them home. And if what your admonitions, if those are taken to heart, then we're just not, you know, assembling others' ideas but we're creating our own ideas and creating jobs. Um, hopefully, we won't need that legacy program in two more generations. They'll just stay home. But that's a significant contribution. In our research enterprise, $378 million of research. We did a uh, funded research. I tip my hat to Lisa Cassis to be part of extending what you said. We couldn't just educate and entertain. We had to conduct research. We calculated that's a $700 million economic impact, um, created 4,200 jobs. Um, that's certainly powerful. And those patents, we hold 600, over 600 worldwide patents today. And people do understand what they are when you go up for a, a promotion now. But Dr. Todd, I think uh, one of your grandest contributions uh, is you taught us how to dream. When a recruiter called me to see if I was interested in the University of Kentucky, uh, she said, what do you know about the University of Kentucky? I knew two things. Uh, I knew um, bucks for brains and I knew the top 20 uh, business plan. When I went to the, I can still remember the hotel, Dr. Todd. I don't remember the meeting I went to, but it was one of these big education meetings and they had, uh, you know, different uh, sessions. And I signed up for the one where Dr. Todd spoke about that plan. And um, I, I appreciate numbers and how you quantify your progress and how you build a business plan and case for it. And I remember being extremely impressed. So those are my impressions. 
Tim Tracy, who is our former provost, dean of pharmacy, I asked him one day, why would you come here? And he gave me about the same answer. And Eric Mundy, who's our uh, vice president, who I was fortunate enough to recruit, I said, why would you come here? And he said, well, you know, I heard about that top 20 business plan. So, you know, Dr. Todd met something along the way that was uh, immovable. Uh, and that was the Great Recession of 2008. Uh, but the dream stayed. And the people who came stayed. So yesterday, Dr. Cassis and I um, met with uh, some investigators who are part of a uh, what can be an extraordinary achievement by the University of Kentucky in terms of a grant we are pursuing. And NIH chose to make a site visit here, and we held it in one of these ballrooms, the one on the end. And at the end, we, we had an hour and a half to make a presentation, and then, Lisa, what was it, a couple hours of Q&A. And all of our investigators, along with our partners at state and local level, uh, were assembled. And I was so impressed. It was extraordinary. It was about the talent. That's why we were at the table. That's why we were being considered. So yesterday when uh, Lisa and I were touring some of our research space and all, uh, some, I got to meet some of those people who were at the table. I said, when did you get here? How long have you been here? 15 years, 16 years, 70. You know, they came as a PhD student. They knew UK as a place to pursue your research and your degree, and they stayed. And so the impact of what you did then is even more profound today, sir. And I hope, I hope you're going to be the first person I call if I get good news about this um, because uh, your contributions in terms of the talent we assembled to go up against the very best, even if we do not get it, for this award to be amongst the select few in the entire United States in what I have to think is going to be one of the most competitive calls for proposals ever um, is an achievement. So I want to thank you. And then I have the honor of doing this. Neat. I couldn't tell by the program where I was going to hand it back to you. but. You know, so I'm so pleased that the Office of Technology uh, Commercialization, in following the spirit and character, the grit and the grace of the University of Kentucky, decided to create a Lifetime Achievement Award in Entrepreneurship to make Lee T. Todd the first recipient, and more important and more fitting, Dr. Todd, is everybody else from here forward that receives this award will receive the Lee T. Todd Lifetime Achievement Award in Entrepreneurships. Congratulations. Sir.